Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. And thank you, um, Laura, for inviting me to be here. Um, I think it's important to have historians. I always think it's important to have historians. Um, but I think it's important to think about history um, when we're thinking about sort of urgent questions of the present, because as my mug says, everything has uh, everything has uh, history. Um, and sort of, I mean, and it's, and you know this, but I think it's worth, it's worth saying all the same that we, that knowing something about the past, thinking well and clearly and with nuance about the past is a necessary, um, a necessary part of interrogating and addressing our present. You know, I don't know that I actually buy into the notion of kind of direct le lessons from past to present, but I definitely think that understanding something about oneself, whether that oneself is individual, community, or nation, is really important for assessing how one goes forward and making decisions about who one wants to be um, going forward. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and put my most important thoughts like out at the very beginning, partially because I have a tendency to get lost in my own stories and particularly um, when I depart from the sort of standard written text. So I'm going to begin with the piece that I wrote out quite explicitly and then um, take it from there. Um, to put my argument first and on the table, I will say um, that in the United States, anti-Black violence is anti-democratic violence and the attack on democracy um, by attacking Black bodies has a long and brutal history. The title of my presentation is Not So Far, The Mainstream Origins of the Far Right. And so this is really the kind of organizing idea behind it. I'll repeat it. In the US, anti-Black violence is anti-democratic violence, and that attack on democracy by attacking Black bodies has a long and brutal history. Like many other folks, I felt stunned when I watched the footage of vigilante mobs in the Unite the Right rally in 2017, and of vigilante mobs in, of, of, or the DC insurrectionists in 2021. Um, but I felt bemused at the same time when I heard commentators and pundits say time and again, this is not who we are. If that we is the United States or more specifically Americans with some possessive investment in white identity, it may not be who we wish to be, but it certainly is who we have been. So folks who frame the racist political violence of the last several years as an aberration Forget what the political historian Gary Gerstel pointed out more than two decades ago, that nationalism has many strains and that the contradictory character of American nationalism, nationalism has been there since the early days of the Republic. Civic nationalism with its promise of individual rights to all Americans, regardless of race or religion or sex, has long been in tension with a racial nat nationalism that defines the United States and its mission in ethno-racial ways. Gerstle, in his book, American Crucible, uses President Theodore Roosevelt, the sort of signal president of both the progressive era and the age of empire. So to think about how those two things um, are happening at the same time to show how these impulses could reside in the same people at the same time. But Roosevelt was not an outlier. The animus against what historian and eugenicist Lothrop Stoddard called in the early part of the 20th century, the rising tide of color against world white supremacy was pervasive and per powerful throughout the 20th century and continues to be into our 21st. Let us not forget that the Ku Klux Klan surged back to life in the early 19 teens um, and, 19, and, and 1920s um, and pop, surged back to life, to popularity and to political power fueled by an opposition to immigration, black political participation and Catholicism right, a re fueled itself to political power through rejection of the very tenets of, of civic nationalism 
that we think of ourselves as holding dear. So I began my career as an historian of the US South, where white supremacy was both a system of political economy and a campaign battle cry. Um, to quote Steve Kandrowitz, the historian, um, it was both a political program and a social argument. That's not to say that the South was exceptional, um, just that it was shameless. It encoded in law and enforced through violence what other regions did in practice, right? So de jure versus de facto. For white Southern elites, racial nationalism was the key to political power. State actors during the age of Jim Crow and after relied on extra legal violence, mob action, individual assaults such as lynchings, um, to bolster legal subordination and to preserve their hold on power, economic and political. In contrast to commentators who painted the post-2016 resurgent white supremacist violence as an aberration, I, like many historians of the South, like many historians of African America, looked upon the scenes unfolding in places like Charlottesville and Washington DC with shock, certainly, but also with some degree of recognition. So it's important to keep in mind that the violent white supremacy campaigns of the early 20th century and of the late 19th century um, were always about politics and about labor, right? About holding on to political power and about defining and controlling black labor and much of white labor in particular ways. So there are places, lots of places and moments where we might um, talk about this. I think, for example, of the South Carolina election season of 1876, um, which provides an illuminating long view on white supremacist militias. In that um, election season in South Carolina, um, um, white Democrats led by gubernatorial candidate Wade Hampton, sort of traveled across the South Carolina upcountry with a sort of paramilitary arm called the Red Shirts in tow. Um, one of the most infamous encounters or moments was um, in Hamburg, North Carolina. I nearly said Hamburg, but I don't think that the upcountry is particularly German in its pronunciation. Um, in Hamburg, South Carolina, in Edgefield County, in which um, a group of white men had a run-in with the formally organized black militia. Edge, Edgefield County was a Republican stronghold, um, a black political stronghold, had a black militia um, who um, some white men, I mean, it's sort of long story, and see, this is where I'm departing, not the story that I mean to be telling you, but um, white men had a sort of small altercation with them in part because they were practicing on the road, white men wanted to pass. Um, that altercation produced sort of um, a conflagration, which ended with rifle companies gathering, white rifle companies sort of gathering and attacking the black militia, um, forcing it to disband and putting to a violent end to reconstruction in South Carolina. In the words of Ben Tillman, who um, was a key part of this riot and who would capitalize on his role in it to sort of win election to the Senate a few years later, the leading white men of Edgefield had, quote, decided to seize the first opportunities that the Negroes might offer them to provoke a riot and teach the Negroes a lesson by having the whites demonstrate their superiority by killing as many of them as was justifiable. Um, Wade Hampton, who um, I mentioned was the gubernatorial candidate in this instance, uh, also used his version of the tale of Hamburg, which turned it from Black self-defense into a tale of Black aggression to sort of mobilize white folks to vote for Democrats in, in the 1876 election, thus gaining the governor's seat. So I distracted myself with South Carolina, but I really wanted to talk in a little more depth about North Carolina instead. What we um, was for a long time known as the Wilmington um, riot, but we've become a little more subtle in our language, too often riots 
evoke some sort of post-World War II vision of property damage when really, when you're talking about um, much of the 20th century, we're talking about things more akin to pogroms, sort of white racial terrorism against Black districts or Black homes or what have you. Um, Wilmington was actually more of a coup d'etat, and I'll tell you a little bit for you to understand why I say that. Um, the Red Shirts, too, made an appearance in North Carolina in the 1890s. Again, this sort of like self-organized um, paramilitary groups starting in Mississippi that sort of made their way across the South, um, trying to do their part to put a violent end to Black political participation in the South. Um, there's a way in which the Wilmington riot, although it was 125 years ago now, feels more recent um, in its rejection of electoral outcomes, in the balled up tangle of racialized and gendered arguments that the, that the participants put forth, in the self-righteousness of their anti-democratic politics, their, the, the Wilmington story resonates even now. Um, perhaps actually even more now than it did when I first learned about it. Um, in the late 1990s. So sort of a little bit of backstory, North Carolina politics in the 1890s were actually pretty exciting in a lot of ways. In 1896, the fusionists swept state elections. The fusionists were an alliance of white populists who were agrarian critics of the region's emerging industrial economy. Um, and allied with reformist Republicans, both black and white. Um, in other words, the fusionists placed their material interests above their racial identities, right? This doesn't mean that every kind of white populist who joined the fusion party was free of the taint of racism. No, it just meant that they understood the value of a political alliance that would help their economic conditions. And that was the thing that mobilized and motivated them. Um, Democrats um, responded by trying to get people, white men, so this is where we go back to the previous talk about sort of like whiteness and a lot of white supremacist politics as an interracial dynamic, right? But getting um, white men to place race above, above economics. Um, they responded in the 1898 political campaigns by painting white fusionists as more than just dissenters. They invoked the apocalyptic tones of American and European eugenicists, and they excoriated their rivals then as feeble, degenerate sons of the white race. So led by the chair of the Democratic Party, Fernifold Simmons, and the publisher of the Raleigh News and Observer, Josephus Daniels, um, a coterie of de Democrats made white supremacy the key to stifling agrarian dissent and guaranteeing the advance of an industrial economy. Um, they strove to convince white voters that their identity as men, as all North Carolina voters were in the 1890s, and more specifically as white men, should override economic concerns or social critique. Um, th they made loyalty to the Democratic Party um, a test of white voters' patriotism in their words, as well as a testament to their manhood, to their pride of race, and to what they called their immemorial, immemorial custom and habit of ruling every other race with which they come into contact. Populists also tried to use the language of manhood, citing small farmers' increased subjection to a market economy as a threat to their manly independence. Um, but Democrats stressed honor over independence as the measure of a man. Um, they used a zero-sum logic in which Black people's gains intrinsically dishonored and weakened white men um, and argued that this sort of weakening left women, white women and children vulnerable. Um, D Daniels, the publisher of the Raleigh News and Observer amplified this argument in his paper by manufacturing a black on white rape scare that insistently linked Negro atrocities, as he called them, to the old bogey of Negro domination. Um, the only way to combat Negro domination, they said, was to seize office. And when voting didn't make sure that they 
um, took the office, Democrats seized state offices through force. So again, I've mentioned the red shirt, who we can think of as white supremacist shock troops, um, somewhere between a civic organization and a terrorist group. They threatened fusion candidates and intimidated black vo voters um, across the state. In Elizabeth City, North Carolina, they destroyed the black newspaper and ran fusion candidates out of town. Um, but their most famous or infamous actions were south of Elizabeth City in Wilmington, where um, the Democratic mayoral candidate, Alfred Waddell, actually lost the election. But after losing the election, led a mob of red shirts, National Guardsmen, and white citizens of all classes in an outright coup. Um, just days after he was defeated, he delivered on a promise that he made during his campaign to choke the current of the campaign of, of the Cape Fear River with black carcasses, if necessary, to gain the mayor's seat. On a rampage, um, white mobs targeted Wilmington's economic infra infrastructure, Black Wilmington's economic infrastructure. Wilmington was actually a thriving Black middle class town in this period, murdered many African Americans and drove out white fusionists, right? Um, there wasn't any writing, a rioting an African American survivor wrote to President William McKinley following the massacre. There was simply the strong slaying the weak. At a minimum, Seven African Americans died, other rest estimates range up to 300, and countless others went into exile. Those left behind begged the McKinley administration to intervene, but the admi administration did nothing. The federal government then, which two decades before had ceased pressing for full Black citizenship with the end of Reconstruction, would no longer even endeavor to slow the ascent of white supremacy. It's important that you understand that the government bowed to Jim Crow in the South because the nominally regional system performed crucial work for the country as a whole. Domestically, exercising African-Americans from the democratic process um, or excising African-Americans from the democratic process came easier than actually exercising true democracy. And it cleared the way for white men to come together across class and across regional boundaries. Foreclosing Black citizenship seemed a small price to pay for reunion between North and South as regions and between Northern capital and Southern capitalists. When we talk about the lingering effect of structural racism then, it's important to keep in mind why people would have invested in those structures in the first place. So I chose 1898, right? It's a long time ago, but I could have crept forward in time with any number of different examples. I could have talked about Elaine um, and Phillips County, Arkansas in the wake of World War I, so the red summer of 1919, in which a combination of white vigilantes and National Guard um, put down a nascent sort of black sharecroppers union by force. Um, and then turned around and put some of those, again, people who defend themselves, defended themselves on trial in a Supreme Court, in a case that went to the Supreme Court as Moore versus Dempsey. I could have talked about Tulsa in 1921. It's an interesting example. I don't know how many of you have watched the HBO show, The Watchmen, but it's actually a really fascinating um, imagining of what would have happened should the U.S. have made reparation to the Black business district, folks in the Black business district of, of Greenwood when it was destroyed. Interesting, both because you look at the sort of the economic basis and how it would have allowed for a different emergence of Black economic power, but then in this imagining also the kind of reactionary, again, paramilitary violence that that act of reparation spawns, right? Um, I could have talked about any number of um, moments in the civil rights movement in which we see, even after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, in fact, a um, kind of white reactionary violence or sort of a, a sort of white reaction that um, 
that is a sort of shows kind of internecine battles, physical, violent, deadly battles over whether the vote is going to be exercised. So whether or not the Voting Rights Act is going to be allowed to be put into, um, into practice. Um, and I also, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep aware of time because I think that I have been, um, been talking for a while. I also would talk a little bit about 1985, the sort of Sagan Penn, um, Sagan Penn book that I'm writing right now, which is about police violence in 1980 San Diego, young man stopped by a police officer, in some ways a very typical story in that it turns violent really at the officer's initiation, but not typical in that Penn defends himself um, and ends up shooting the officer and a fellow officer in, in self-defense, wounding one policeman, killing another. It's a horrifically, heartbreakingly tragic story in a lot of ways. He's not convicted in part because it comes out during the, um, during the trial that the officer who initiated the encounter is um, racist even by the standards of the San Diego cops in the 1980s, has done a little kind of like paramilitary training with kind of white groups in, in the desert, in the San Diego desert on the weekends. And so thinking about the story of those 1980s weekend warriors, there are sort of ways that as Kathleen Ballou in Bring the War Back Home has talked about them as emerging out of, again, the sort of like tangle of mili militarism and masculinity and a sort of reaction of, she would say the wars in Southeast Asia, I would say coupled with the sort of decolonial wars in Africa, in which you see actual sort of self-avowed um, white supremacists in, in Rhodesia sort of, you know, coming out of that war and becoming mercenaries and kind of feeding into this culture. Like thinking about the ways that that pen story intersects with this broader um, Cold War militia moment story is really intriguing and important for thinking through what the 1980s were and the sort of paramilitary movement that they helped generate in the 1980s, but also an important reminder for us as we think about 2020 that there are moments in the past, recent and distant, that resonate with our, our sort of our, our current moment. Again, not exactly the same. I would always resist these arguments that things are exactly the same. Historians are big over change, big on change over time. The more compelling question is to think about why there are some things that look so similar, um, even though we know that they're different. Sort of what carries, right? What carries and reinvents itself? The historian Glenda Gilmore has talked about the protean nature of white supremacy, that it is a thing it receives pressure from social movements of all kinds, and it remakes itself as a new thing, pulling on kind of sort of pieces of the past, but the contexts of the present to sort of generate its now. Um, and maybe that's actually the place to, to leave it. We can continue talking about this, well, for the next two days. Um, and I thank you for your time.